Today, our guest is author John Dobbin, and we're here to talk about characters killing for survival. So I'm going to let him introduce himself now. So take it away. Hi, I'm John Dobbin. Uh, I am a writer primarily of horror and Western horror fiction. Um, a lot of my books were published through Engine Publishing, which is a local Newfoundland publisher and Atlantic Canada publisher overall, I guess. And I also publish through Raven Tail Publishing, uh, where I publish a lot of novellas and things like that. I live in uh, Mount Pearl, Newfoundland with my family, my three kids, my wife, a dog, and a cat. Sounds like a very full house. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll talk first about crafting the uh, killer, uh, survival killer. Um, mm -hmm. How do you turn on a character's violent survival mode? Is there a buildup or do you just throw them into the situation immediately? Well, I think it really depends on the character. So in my first book, The Starving, uh, the protagonist is a bounty hunter, a bit of a drunk. Uh, and he's also suffering from some past trauma involving uh, like his loved ones. So he he's a person who doesn't want to kill. He's a bit uh, down on himself, down on things, but he doesn't want to kill. He still has that core kind of goodness in him, I guess. Uh, but when, when he's pushed into a corner or his back is to the wall, he will. So survival is what can push him forward, what will push him towards that. And it makes him willing to do things that he normally wouldn't do. And so for his type of character, that's, that's what would cause him to, to move forward and, and to kill. Okay, so when you're you're crafting the first kill for a character who's doing it purely for survival or, or self-defense or whatever, um, do you prefer to do it sort of in the moment or is it like a planned murder, like we see the people, we need the food sort of a thing, we're mm -hmm. planning this out? Yeah. Which do you favor? Um, well, writing-wise, uh, so I, took, I look at this two different ways. So writing-wise, I tend to plan everything out ahead of time and just but like a very tentative plan right uh so i kind of get an idea of okay this is going to be the motivations to kill here this is why he's going to do this but as i'm writing i'm sure as you know sometimes the characters don't want to work the way you want them to work and it kind of takes a life of its own and so sometimes killing just happens to to flow or works better in the scene than you thought it would in terms of the characters themselves i tend to write uh, typical white hat, black hat type characters, so good guys, bad guys. So if I was writing a black hat character, they would probably have it planned out ahead of time. They would see things and want to do it that way. Whereas if I was writing my good guys, the white hats, uh, they'd rather do it in the moment, or I'd rather them do it in the moment. They don't want to do it at all. But for So for me, for me to push that home that they're the good guys, I wouldn't make them plan out to kill. They'd just go in there try and do something and if it came down to it they'd have to kill so how much emotional ramifications do you go into after something like that happens for me a lot of my big murders or, or killing scenes happen in the climax or near the end of the book uh, so we don't get to see a whole lot of how much the character is suffering but in my uh, first couple of books, The Starving and The Risen, it's a follow-up. The Risen's a follow-up to The Starving. And in that sequel, uh, I attempted to show how Weston had turned into, my main character had turned into a bit of a broken man, like he's plagued by guilt and fear. And it was a big part of what he had to overcome throughout the second novel, was what he had to do in the first novel and how he did it. 
and how he can get over it. Cool. So uh, what types of justifications do you use for your characters when, when having them kill? And how does it affect their empathy and morality in the long term? Well, since I write the typical good or good versus bad kind of thing, I, I'd say that morality is a big thing that I look at. Sure, there are shades of gray, but for the most part, the good and there's the good and the bad. So the bad kill without compunction, whereas the good only kill when they have to. And that's kind of the line of morality that I look at there. Uh, how do you um, deal with your character's mental state if something happens to, say, their loved ones or their friends? Of course, if you're in a survival situation, there are going to be people who die around mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So how does that affect your mental, their mental state and what kind of um, things do you go into with your characters in that regards? Yeah, well, I mean, losing your loved ones is probably one of the most uh, devastating things I can think of. So when my characters lose a loved one they they tend to crumble at least a little bit like there's a, a moment that's a changing moment for them and it's not just the the kind of kill your dar darlings or fridging or anything any of those tropes which i'm sure it could fall into at some point or another but they tend to really lose their way for a little while once something like that happens it doesn't always force them to uh, move on to something good or to move on towards the story they they have to work through what happened to them before the story can continue yeah have you ever used one of those killing off the loved one situations for shock value or to really just kind of shake up the reader yes um my uh my wife is my um, alpha or beta reader. She's the first person that sees my writing at, once it's done. Maybe even before my my first round of edits, she's the first person that reads it. And so uh, in one of my books, I had written it a couple of different times and knew I had to make changes to it. So she read the original version and then she read the revised version. In the revised version, I ended up killing one of the... Um, main character is not like he was a, a very close person to the main character and in the first book first version of the book he survived and it was kind of a happier ending in the second version of the book he he died and i had to make him die for the character to continue darkening path i guess throughout the series of books that i'm writing so yeah I've, I've had to do that it wasn't more like it was for shock value for my wife i purposely did it just to annoy my wife a little bit um but it also had other reasons as well you know like i thought it would work better for the path i had set up for that character okay so um when you're crafting different survival personalities what kind of thought goes into doing a cold-blooded killer as a person who's just in it to survive and doesn't want to kill I think with a cold-blooded killer, uh, I still don't want to make them like a two-dimensional, or I don't want to give them some sort of background. So I think for a cold-blooded killer, there's something that's happened to them in the past that has caused them to get this way. And the person who kills to survive is kind of like the cold-blooded killer before he became a cold-blooded killer. And so when I have those two, two types of characters, it's kind of them playing off of each other. The cold-blooded killer is the version of the kills or survive that went bad you know like oh. he took one path the wrong way and so when i'm writing a good guy or a kill to survive character i have to present him the same a similar path he has to have, there's two paths in front of him and one he will turn into the cold-blooded killer and the other one he'll stay who he is the kill or survive and so when i try and create them i try and create it with that in mind with their past in mind with things that have happened to them in their lifetime so that we can tell as readers and as people and me as a writer we can see that it wasn't just a spur of the moment thing this isn't just evil for the sake of evil in most cases there are some things where sometimes when that happens but there are people and choices were made and this is what happened so you use a duality theme and sort of play each other them off each other that's very interesting mm -hmm. Okay, so um, how much does setting play into creating murderous characters with your books? 
I think it can play a, a pretty big part. Um, so with me, I, I typically write in isolated places. And so the feeling of being alone without aid can certainly add to the character's desperation. It can kind of add to that putting their back to a wall where they have to kill to survive. Um, so I think that the setting can really affect how a character is going to interact with others when they come upon them especially in my scenarios where there's um, maybe a deserted forest a desert a mountainous area with lots of snow and like there's real a, a real fight for survival and so when you add um, another character into the mix and like you said earlier if you see someone with lots of food you know are you going to just run and kill them you're going to try and talk to them it kind of adds a little bit more desperation and that desperation then adds that extra path that they can take okay so do you ever play with just man versus nature um yes and no um i do play man versus nature for parts of most of my books because as i said i write western horror so it takes place in the wild west and so there is a bit of a nature thing going on there and my more recent uh novellas with raven tail i'm writing a lot about um survivalists and mountain men and things like that so people who really know the nature live within the nature um and so i would say yes but also with a caveat that these people actually really know the the nature around them they live in the nature they're part of nature and so nature isn't necessarily the same thing it would be for say me in real life being tossed into nature by myself i'd be you know lost for words but these people they can deal with it for the most part it's just the the more serious situations that they get stuck into is usually uh, made worse by the enemies they're facing and a lot of times i have uh, monsters i guess you could say uh, supernatural creatures who are part of the nature around them and so it's kind of a fight between two people who are representing different parts of that nature okay so you mentioned you write a lot of western so i'm assuming you use a lot of uh, guns in in your mm -hmm. book so what other types of weapons do you use as well well, yeah, guns were a big thing. Guns and rifles, you know, six shooters for, for uh, to keep that Western flavor going. But lately, I've actually decided to make my main character stay away from guns. And so he's in the Wild West, but he only uses axes and knives. That's he's, interesting. Yeah, well, he's a typical survivalist, right? He's a mountain man, and he thinks that he could get as much work done with a bow and arrow as he could with that so with with a gun so he just keeps his axes and his his knives and he knows how to make a bow and arrow so if he needs one he'll make one and that's kind of the way he looks at it and it sets him apart you know from the other people that he's competing with in that world that i'm writing in yeah does it leave him in a disadvantage though because i would think that a gun would be gives someone more of an advantage in certain situations than than a bow and arrow but yeah yeah no definitely he has been left in a disadvantage quite a bit now i i do make it known in my books that he can certainly wield a, a gun he just chooses not to and so i actually haven't had him pick up a gun to use it against someone else or like a monster or anything as of yet in the books that i've written about him uh, but it probably will happen at some point. It's just that he chooses to use what he's most comfortable with. And that, like you said, it, it causes a bit of problems for him, but it also creates a little bit more interest, not only for the reader, perhaps, to try and figure out how he's going to survive, but for me as a writer to say, you know, okay, I don't have this gun as a crutch to the lie on now. What am I going to do? How is he going to deal with an axe and a knife when someone's coming at him with a couple of rifles and a gun? so yeah he's got to use his brain a little more i would think yeah yeah definitely <laughs> okay so um when you're writing a survivalist book there's a lot of different things you can uh, different scenarios and you've got the lone wolf survivalist mm -hmm. type of character and then you've got the sort of the family dynamic where you've got a family that's suddenly got to survive somewhere like a post-apocalyptic sort of a scenarios mm -hmm. 
come to mind. So how do you deal with writing both of those things? I, I stick mostly to the lone wolf survivalist now. That's kind of my wheelhouse, I guess, right now. And to be honest, I kind of enjoy that a little bit more. Even when I wrote about groups and friends, like big groups, it always used to come down to one character for me anyway. Like, it was almost like one of those old slasher movies you'd see where, like, there's a group of friends and then suddenly it gets wheeled down to the final person kind of thing. Um, so I always kind of focus that way. But I always like the lone wolf survivalist thing because it reminds me a bit of the old school kind of pulpy adventure stories, like the stuff written by Robert E. Howard, like Conan the Barbarian and anything similar to that because and that's the kind of thing i'm trying to go for with the western stuff that i'm writing you know it's just a kind of an adventure scary western that just kind of takes place that way but for families and i have i have written that not a real family per se but like families in terms of friends you know like a big group of that are very close with one another and as I said, it just kind of always comes down to the one person in that group that survives. And so it's always the one that I'm focusing on. Yeah. So basically a lot of them are just doomed, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, when does a survivalist turn into a predator? How do you walk that line with the character and, and keep him sympathetic, for lack yeah. of another word, to a reader? Yeah, it's hard because, like... If you're going to have someone who's a lone wolf, you kind of got to make them a little bit menacing anyway. You know, it has to be someone who has to be alone kind of thing, right? And not used to living with and working with other people. But there needs to be hints that when push comes to the shove, you know, they're going to go over the edge in a bad way. At the same time, you also have to have something there that helps soften them, make them more human. You give them human touches, per se, here and there. Um, so a worry that's relatable, or in my case with the guy I was just talking about, he has an aversion to guns. You know, something that will allow other characters and the reader to feel a little bit more sympathetic towards them. In that, you know, this is a, a person who lives his life, he survives this way, but he is unable to use probably the easiest thing to help him survive, which is a gun, um, in these days anyway, in the days I'm writing it. And so it kind of gives him something that makes him more human, because we all have that. There's always a line that we don't want to cross, and things that we don't want to do. And I think as Canadians, we're kind of easier to say, yeah, I'd rather not use a gun anyway kind of thing, right? Mm. Um, so that's where I went with this guy is, you know, other than for other reasons as well. But that's one of the things I wanted to make him seem a little bit more human, a little bit less, you know, snarling and and just kind of antisocial. Okay. So you also uh, use supernatural forces, creatures, whatever, in, mm -hmm. in some of your books. So how do you um, handle them as opposed to human antagonists? Yeah. Well, like you said, I usually use supernatural. That's the yard I like to play in. And so it allows me to put man versus something bigger than them, more vast, something that might be beyond their comprehension, but at the same time doesn't override our basic survival instincts so when a character can overcome that it's a much bigger accomplishment i find um for the characters and for the readers who are going along with him when it comes to people i tend to have people come and go as antagonists in it in one of my books i had a kind of a mixture there was a group of people who were wearing the black hats as i would say and the supernatural element at the same time who they were trying to work with and so you kind of again just going back to where you try and make the reader see that these are people but they made that one choice that pushed them the wrong way and what what was that choice how can we tell how, how do we know are they the same as our main character like i mentioned earlier or are they completely different and there was a different type of choice that was put ahead of them, right? Um, so that's kind of where I look at the, the human side of it. 
Okay, so in a lot of uh, survival fiction, a uh, post-apocalyptic sort of thing, you've always got the strong characters and you have the more weaker characters, the ones that sometimes get killed off quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it, it's a common trope. So do you use that trope? Do you play weak versus strong characters off each other? Do you do twists with it? Yeah, I think um, I, I like to play that. I like to do the twist. I like to have a twist there because I don't like I don't like to call anybody weak. I, I don't. I think that's that's not realistic. I think everybody can be strong in their own way. In my most recent novella that came out, uh, the it stars the guy who only uses axes and knives. That's the main character, but he's a he's a, a tracker and a guide through a forest, and he ends up taking a young married couple, and the wife is very spoiled and you know has ha lived a pretty pretty good life up to that point until she goes into the woods and so naturally in, in normal cases you would probably see her as the weak one but i made her the strong one she's even stronger than the stoic main character who um is there trying to lead her through the woods she becomes kind of the while she's still not the main character she is kind of the heart of the story and she is the one who you kind of look at and say yeah she's she's pretty strong she has what it takes to get through this and the main character then tries to keep up with her because of that okay and so these last three questions are just for fun and mm -hmm. just a little play with the for the viewers what is the most creative death you've ever given a character i'm not as creative as i'd like to think i am um unfortunately but i the the worst death i ever came up with for someone was um a man was seriously injured and left to die in the middle of a desert just left there to die um so that was i think for me of all the different types of death that you could have being alone in the middle of nowhere kind of dying like that that would be the worst and so that's that's the one that i came up with for that one Okay, so what is the oddest thing you've researched that's related to a character death? Again, not the most creative, but the smell of burning human flesh. That is the, the oddest thing I've searched for. It's also very gross. <laughs> okay, um, we will have to talk about that after off camera, I think. <laughs> So, um, do you have a favorite weapon or method when you're killing a character, or do you like to mix it up? Um, so my first two big novels, my bad guys have died by fire, it, hence the research I did. So I'd assume that's what I'd call my my favorite. I don't know if I'd say it that way, but uh, but I really kind of had to step away from that because fire itself is easy enough to use, especially when I, you write things like me, you're writing about supernatural and things like that, like Burn the Witch, you know, like fire has been typically that kind of way of dealing with supernatural. But I'm trying to step away from that because it's too easy. Um, it's too easy to go about that. It's not as interesting if every novel ends with someone being burnt, you know, to, yeah. to save someone but else. Technically, they didn't burn witches, except in Germany, though. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> they actually yeah. hung witches and then burned the bodies. That's yeah. where the fire comes in. Yeah, but um, there was a, a song, I think, called Burn the Witch by Queens mm -hmm. of the Stone Age that I was quoting. But, yeah, no, you're totally right. Um, I didn't do a whole lot of research on that. It's just, you know, when you look up different things, I think vampires have an aversion to fire yeah. you know there's a bunch of different supernatural creatures that have an aversion to fire and so that's kind of where i end up putting myself i end up putting myself in a corner where it's like okay well i guess fire is the thing that's going to do it but i need to kind of step away from that anyway so yeah okay so um well thank you for being a guest on the today's episode it was a pleasure chatting with you and so they're going to wrap it up and that's it for this episode and join us for the next episode of words that kill bye for now mm -hmm.